We're going to point lights at a gray wall today. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin with strobepro.com and today I want to talk to you about light output and how you can make informed decisions as a buyer by digging a layer deeper than the specs sheet. There are various measurements that manufacturers use to express light output. With continuous lights you're usually going to see a lux rating, uh, with strobes you're going to see an output in watt seconds, and with speed lights you're often going to see a guide number. The problem with these various units of measurement is that they all kind of suck in their own way. <laughs> Each gives us sort of an imprecise way of comparing lights of the same type, and that of course adds a huge layer of complexity to comparing lights of different types. Honestly guys, it's a mess. <laughs> I'm going to get into why these various forms of measurement all kind of suck, and I'm also going to hopefully give you a more intuitive way to compare lights of different types. And yeah, that's always been a real challenge, especially if you don't have a bunch of lights of different types kicking around that you have sort of practical experience with. If you're just looking at these charts, you probably don't know where to begin. Lux. What is lux? Well, lux is a measure of brightness at the center of a projection at a defined distance, usually, but not always, one meter. And that's kind of the first reason why lux can be an unreliable form of measurement, uh, at least if you're not looking too carefully, because manufacturers can't necessarily seem to agree on what the standard is. And in fact, you'll often see less powerful lights like, say, tiny LEDs uh, measured at closer distances than one meter, and that's presumably to make them look more impressive than they actually are. So if you are looking at the lux rating, pay attention to what the distance uh, at which the lux was measured is, and that should be defined. The inverse square law of light tells us that if we half the distance between our light and our subject, the reflected intensity is going to be quadrupled. So it's easy to see how manufacturers might be padding those numbers in their favor sometimes. The second reason lux kind of sucks is because of the physical design of various lights, like lights come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and there are some particularly interesting examples in the world of COB LEDs, like this one for instance. Uh, the lux rating on this light was taken with the reflector it ships with, which seems fair enough, right? But just watch what happens when we swap this reflector for a different one. Just look at how much more even the projection becomes. I'd venture a guess that most of us would say this is a better reflector than the stock reflector. But that evenness is coming at a cost to center brightness, which of course is where lux is measured. The total output is the same regardless of the reflector, but the stock reflector gives us a higher lux rating. And to try to be fair to Godox, I don't know if using this reflector was purely intended just to boost the lux rating on their lights, because honestly this is a great option if you really want to throw the light over a long distance, where that brighter center projection might fully cover your subject. And I've also found examples where the lux rating is painting a less than favorable picture of a light. For example, this SZ200 bicolor has a removable diffusion cap on the front of it. The diffusion cap is useful for evening out color temperatures on a bicolor light, but it's not very useful if you're just trying to measure total light output. I would have loved to have shown you the difference that removing this cap makes in real space, but it's a popular light and we sold our display model. Anyway, you get the drift. A lux rating cannot tell the whole story about how bright a light is. Let's talk about watts. If you want an equally imprecise way to compare continuous lights, look to their power consumption. <laughs> now, watts can give you a good way of comparing lights of the same technology and from the same generation. For example, all these yellow badge Godox lights. I can pretty confidently say that this VL300, which is a 300 watt light, is in fact twice as bright as this 150 watt VL150. However, when comparing continuous lights of different types, like incandescence, LEDs, halogens, compact fluorescence, or even LEDs from different generations. These technologies are all going to have differences in their luminous efficiency, which is the amount of energy that is converted to light instead of lost as heat. Now people like using watts because there's a degree of familiarity there. 
Household bulbs are usually measured in watts, and you probably know that if you get a 60 watt LED bulb, it's going to be a lot brighter than a 60 watt incandescent bulb. So it all makes sense, but there's still not a very accessible way of comparing lights of different types. And the other thing about watts is that they are often confused with watt seconds. You know, a lot fewer people would confuse watts with watt seconds if we just use the more concise SI unit that already exists to describe them. Yes, watt seconds are joules, a measure of total energy. A watt can be rewritten as a joule per second, or a watt second per second. And yeah, you see the, the S's, they, they cancel each other out, so that's how that works. I'll explain it in another way. Watt seconds are a measure of total energy while watts are a measure of total energy used per second. Strobes are measured in watt seconds because they release all of their energy over a very short period of time, stored in their capacitors, while continuous lights are measured in watts because they consume energy continuously in order to produce light. So if you're following along, 300 watt seconds would be the same amount of energy that a 300 watt continuous light would use over one second. So that kind of tells you just how much more powerful strobes are than continuous lights. <laughs> so if you saw like a 300 watt second strobe and you thought that would be comparable to a 300 watt LED light, think again. Assuming we had a fictional flash that was 300 watt seconds and a continuous light that was 300 watts and both had identical luminous efficiency, the flash would go off at full power and then you would need a full second exposure to match that with the continuous light. Now, in fact, LEDs are quite a bit more efficient than flash tubes, but still not nearly enough to make up that gap. So TLDR, flashes are more powerful than continuous lights. I'm sorry, they just are. Okay, so now that we've talked about that nerdy stuff, let's talk about watt seconds in their own right. Um, are they a useful tool for comparing strobes? Well, yeah, actually, they kind of are. If you're just looking at strobes, uh, there are not too many differences in electrical efficiency and in the flash tube technologies. Generally speaking, a 600 watt second light is going to be about a stop brighter than a 300 watt second light. However, once again, there are some physical differences between strobes that can affect light output, so we can't derive brightness on a target from a strobe's energy capacity alone. For example, the AD600 Pro here has this frosted cover on the front of its glass protector, and while I think this was a good design for helping to eliminate hot spots, it's definitely going to affect your meter readings if you're using just the bare bulb or a simple reflector. Forgoing this frosted cover would have probably improved the AD600 Pro's guide number. Your studio strobe may not have a guide number listed by the manufacturer, but they are almost always listed for speed lights. A guide number can be used to determine the range at which you will get a correct flash exposure. You take the guide number and you divide that by your F number, and that gives you the distance at which a full powered flash will give you a correct exposure. However, you should pay attention to whether the guide number is in meters or feet, and whether the guide number was measured at ISO 100 or ISO 200. Knowing the guide number of your flash can be useful if you're using the bare flash and you're shooting on film and you have a measuring tape handy, <laughs> but it once again sort of falls short of giving us the complete picture of how bright a flash is. The most notable problem is that the guide number you see on a specs sheet is usually given at the flash's maximum zoom setting. If you had two flashes with identical output, but one just zoomed in a little bit further than the other, well, it's able to paint more light on a smaller target, which is where that meter reading is going to be taken. So it's going to have a higher guide number, even though it's not any more powerful than the other flash. And if you took each flash and you individually put them into the same modifier, you would quickly see that they are about the same in terms of output. So we have all these measurements that we're supposed to be able to use to compare the intensity of various lights, but they all just kind of fall short in their own way. And worse yet, they don't really translate a lot of the time. Like it's, it's, there's no intuitive way to compare continuous lights to strobes. And with the number of hybrid shooters out there, I think there has to be a better way. 
The Strobe Pro Power Scale is something that I developed to help you compare lights of various types in a more intuitive way, all in one chart. By following a set of rules, I was able to create a system by which I could compare flashes, strobes, COB LED lights, panel LEDs, any type of light really, and compare I did with a light meter at a six foot distance. Now because continuous lights and flashes were going to be compared on the same chart, I needed to establish a benchmark shutter speed for my continuous lights. Now with a flash, the time value of your flash exposure is fixed. Whether you're shooting at 1 200th of a second or 1 60th of a second, the flash usually occupies a shorter period of time than that. And that's why your shutter speed generally does not affect flash exposure. The opposite is true for continuous lights. When you double your exposure time, you are also doubling the total gathered light. I chose 1 1 25th of a second for my continuous lights because that's a pretty good shutter speed for shooting a portrait. And again, because we're comparing both strobes and continuous lights, I had to choose the most common photography use case. Next, I needed a way to iron out design differences between various lights. And I thought the easiest way to do that would be to just put them inside a common modifier. I chose the 24 by 36 inch Rapid Pro softbox because I thought that would be a small enough softbox that various classes of lights would be able to disperse the light evenly inside it. And with the more even output coming out of that softbox, we should get more useful comparative readings. Any of our smaller panel LEDs or tube lights or ring lights would be exempt from being modified because I think that reflects uh, more closely how they are used in the real world. If you're in your studio, you've probably got a softbox on your COB LED light or your strobe, whereas your panels, uh, you know, ring lights, that sort of thing, if you're mixing them in, they're probably unmodified. Again, practicality was the name of the game here. I wanted measurements that would be really useful in the real world. But because you know the set of rules I'm using, you can ascertain more information than first appears in this graph. For example, you know that if you're using 1 60th of a second instead of 1 1 25th, all of the continuous lights are going to bump up by one stop. And you know that if we were to remove the softbox from the strobes, speed lights, or COB LED lights, that they're just going to climb that much further ahead of the small panels that really weren't designed to be modified. Once I metered every light in the shop, I was able to plot this graph. The Godox R1 had the lowest output of any light that I measured, so I decided to plot that as our 1.0 on the Strobe Pro power scale. Any whole number above that represents an additional stop of light. Photographers and videographers understand stops on a much more intuitive level than they understand lux, watt seconds, watts, or guide number. But to be clear, if you're not familiar with stops, um, sorry, we're photographers and videographers, so we're not going to make this like too, too easy for you. Uh, but this is a logarithmic set of numbers. So a two is twice as bright as a one, a three is four times as bright as a one, and a four is eight times as bright as a one. So if you are really new to this stuff and that didn't make much sense, I definitely would suggest uh, learning what a stop of light is because that's going to help you read my chart. And more importantly, it's just going to help you in your photography or videography journey in general. If you want to see all of the details about how I obtained this data and my whole process for it, check out the complete article. I'm going to post a link in the description below. It lives on the Strobe Pro blog and we do try to keep it up to date as best as possible. At the moment, I only have Godox lights plotted on the chart because that's what was available to me. I would really love to add lights from other brands and as time goes on maybe we'll throw in some pro photos, Ellen Crumbs, apertures, all those kinds of lights. But even if you are looking at other brands, I think the Strobe Pro Power Scale can still give you some insights into how different classes of lights really compare in a real world setting. Wow, okay, that was probably the nerdiest video we've ever done here, so thanks for sticking with me. And guys, until next time, enjoy creating.